Every Christian needs to do what God wants, obey his will, follow commands, pursue his plan for our lives, and we need to know how to do it. What teaches us to follow God's will? What inspires us to want to obey his commands? What enables us to say yes to God and no to sin? So, how in the world do you do it? The book of Titus specializes on one command that comes up again and again for older Christians and younger Christians, for men and women, for pastors, for all kinds of workers. And that command is this, control yourself. Be self-controlled is a theme that pops up in every chapter of the book of Titus. So my question for you this morning is, how do you do it? When you're face to face with the easy path, with the choice that would give you some short-term pleasure, how, how do you find the strength to say no? No to sin so that you can say yes to God. Sorry, Farrell, you wanna, I got a hot mic up here reverberating on me, you wanna turn that down? I get sick of listening, that's better. I get sick of listening to myself sounding like that all, all morning long. Yeah, so that's, that's the question, right? How do you, how do you practice self-control? And I'm not just talking about self-control with like eating dessert or portion size. I'm talking about self-control with spiritual things. How do you say no to sin that's going to feel really good in the moment so you can think of long-term pleasure and obedience to God? Now that's a a huge question because think of what's resting on your ability to be self-controlled this week. I mean, for those of you who are married... Self-control might be the difference between a marriage that makes it and one that doesn't. If you can't control that desire in your heart to be right right now, to get what you want in the moment, think about my feelings, my my desires, what I prefer. Like If if you can't control that, a a me-first heart makes a mess. But you first makes us blessed. If you can control yourself and serve and love and give and be selfless, you can have a home that is so good, that's so good for kids to grow up in, that's just so fun to go home to. So how do you control yourself? Or if you're like between 18 and 30, let's say you're a guy, uh, how do you control yourself? I I would bet 92% of your buddies are in hot pursuit of short-term worldly pleasure. They're after the girls, the high, the money, the career, stuff that will not matter a bit when they're 70. So how do you control yourself and not go down that same path? How do you think about God and faith and family? How do you not become another guy who's working 60 hours a week and he's a rock star out there, but when he comes home, he's the exact opposite? because he's got nothing left. How do you do it? And how do you do it with substances? When pornography is a click away and, and getting drunk is possible on a thousand corners here in Appleton, like, how, how do you say no to the moment so you can feel good tomorrow morning? Uh, so many of us know how destructive addiction is. So how, how do we control ourselves when, if we wanted it, we could have it. Or if you're a parent, right, and, and your kid is like just, he's pushing the button, right? This is, this is like what it means to be a kid for like 20 years. You, just, you push the button, you see what you can get away with. How are you a parent who is a lot like our heavenly parent? One who has good boundaries and strict rules, but he doesn't lose it and blow up. Instead, his boundaries are with love and patience and forgiveness and grace. Like, how do you get to a kid's heart to change it instead of just screaming for obedience and conformity in the moment? See, it doesn't matter if it's with beer or with marriage, if it's with work or the internet, with your words, your choices. Like, everything from this week hinges on your ability to control yourself. 
So, how do you do it? The answer is lots and 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 lots of motivation. Just because the way that the human heart is wired, you and I need a list of reasons about this long to say no to the stuff that feels good in the moment. Do you know what the, the proof of that is? The Bible app. I don't know if you have that little uh, brown squared Bible app on your phones or your tablets. A bunch of you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever thought about that? How, how many psychological techniques it takes to actually read the Bible? Think about this for a second. The Bible app doesn't just have, like, the Bible in your pocket. Instead, what does it do? It breaks down the Bible into, like, a simple reading plan for those of you who are organized. It gives you little daily circles that you can check off for those of you who are, like, competitive and achievers and you, you can't go to sleep unless the box is checked. Um, it does community. You can connect with friends who can encourage you and inspire you. They even have celebrity endorsements. You know, some Christian band has their, their new plan that you can read. They have push notifications if you're kind of forgetful. They even added this past year uh, streaks of days you open the Bible. Like, like you Snapchat people, you just couldn't survive if your streak ended. Why, why do they do all that? Why 10 different techniques just to get you to read this book that you could have on paper in your hands? And the answer is because they know how people work. That it takes a whole lot of motivation for people to make the right choice. And that's actually why I love the Bible. It's not just the Bible app. The Bible itself gives us reason after reason after reason after reason after reason after reason, after reason to say no to sin. Um, I don't have time to cover all the reasons today, but, but just think of what happens. When you sin, you know, it feels good in the moment, but then it makes life a wreck. Yeah, you can party, you can get high, and then you're 32, seven years into an addiction, and no one thinks you're that impressive anymore. So it, it's good to say no to sin. It's good to say yes to God. It brings joy and health and happiness. And today, we get to look at the best reason of all. You know, of all the things that God says, like, no, don't mess up your life. Yes, this could make you so happy. Like, at the top of that list, God is going to give his best reason. And today, if you're a person who's looking for a little bit more self-control, you just want to do life right, the right way this week. You don't want to end up next Sunday with regrets and things you have to confess because you made the bad choice in the moment. I want to share with you today the number one way that God inspires people to be selfless and self-controlled. So we're going to jump into the end of Titus chapter 2 today. You can find these verses on the screen where the Apostle Paul says this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It, that's grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Now hopefully you notice the self-control that God wants there. He, he says, say no to worldly passions, say yes to a self-controlled life, and in fact, don't just say yes. God says, I want you to be eager to say yes. I want you to be disgusted by anything that would be short-term pleasure. And I want you to be excited about anything from God that would be a true blessing. In other words, God is saying to you that you should not be like Pitbull. And if you know the Miami-based rapper Pitbull... One, two hands. This, uh, this illustration at the 7.30 a.m. service did not go over really well. So, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, P 
Pitbull's had like uh, a thousand songs on the radio. He's super gifted at, at rapping. Uh, back in 2011, though, he released one of his biggest hits. It's called Give Me Everything. And I'm not going to rap it for you today. Because <laughs> you deserve better than that. <laughs> but I'm going to let you read uh, the words that he sang in the bridge. He, he rapped this. He said, I might drink a little more than I should tonight. And I might take you home with me if I could tonight. And baby, I'm going to make you feel so good tonight because we might not get tomorrow. Some of you singing the song now. Let's do it tonight. But did you catch his logic? Why does he want to drink too much and bring some stranger home and make her feel so good? Because he... He revealed his own logic. We might not get tomorrow. Let's not think about then. Let's think about now, he says. And you don't have to be like a Miami rapper to think that way. Did you know that there's a little pit bull in every human heart? Like rapping to you, whispering to you, telling you, let's do this. And it's super persuasive. Like, how good would it feel if you just spoke your mind and put him in his place? I mean, how awesome would it be if you just ignored your mom's call to dinner and just kept playing Call of Duty? How much easier would it be if you just skipped class and, and slept in and drank a little bit too much? You know, that, the little pit bull is always, that's why temptation is tempting, right? Because there's something good about it. But did you notice the flaw in Pitbull's logic? We might not get tomorrow, he said. In 2011. But he actually did get it tomorrow. And if he drank too much, he woke up hungover. And if he hooked up with some stranger, they woke up, heads hurting, hearts empty, maybe pregnant. Sin always wants to end the story way too early as if there is no tomorrow, but your, your Father in Heaven knows that there is. And so he says, control yourself. Turn the volume down on that little pit bull. Tell him he's an idiot. His logic is bad. There is a tomorrow. And I'm not just thinking about tonight. I'm thinking about the end of the story. Which brings us back to the original question. Okay. Make, makes sense. But How? I mean, if you've ever been in an argument with another human being, you know that you don't think logically, right? You, you just forget about everything except winning. So how, in the heat of the moment of temptation, do you control yourself? Well, I brought the answer with me today. The Ten Commandments. These, these aren't the originals, by the way. These are just wood. That, uh, <laughs> my, my wife's a preschool teacher here at St. Peter, and she use these for her lesson on Moses, and some little four-year-old said to her, these aren't real, they're made of wood. <laughs> they haven't found the kid's body since. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. All right. Um, do any of you who were, like, raised maybe in Christian school or in a Christian home, um, do you know how the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 begin? Anyone know? Yeah, if you had a guess, you might say, you shall have no other gods, the first commandment. Uh, did you know, though, in Hebrew, the first commandment is actually right here? You shall have no gods before me? Which kind of begs the question, well, what's up there? <laughs> if this is commandment number one, what, what did God say before he told his people what to do? I'll translate for you. And God said all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, your God, the God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Before God got to these rules, he reminded them of this relationship. I'm your God. And before he told them all this really hard stuff to do, he reminded them of the greatest thing that he had already done. I rescued you. 
And way back on Mount Sinai, God was revealing the greatest way that he motivates the human heart. It's not with promises of an easier tomorrow. It's not with threats that sin is going to mess up your life. The greatest way that God knows to change your heart is with love. Love you don't expect. With the grace of God. And that's what Paul picks up on in this section. Be self-controlled, he says to the church. And then he gives us three reasons why. Let me show you in Titus chapter 2. He said, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. <laughs> I mean, think of the love in that verse. God's grace, which is his undeserved love, has appeared. But, like the stars might appear after a, a cloudy night. There was some time in your life, maybe when you were little, maybe when you were older, where you saw it. Like before maybe you just believed what so many billions of people believe that God loves good people. If you're a good enough person and you try your best, you get to go to a better place. Like karma was kind of the natural instinct of your heart. But then grace appeared. Then you realize that what Jesus did wasn't for those who earned it or deserved it. It was a gift he just gave. Not to some people. It says it brings and offers salvation to all people. And it's so amazing, that moment when grace appears to you, when it really dawns, not just in your head, but your heart, that God's grace doesn't check IDs. and doesn't look back to see if you checked all the boxes. That Jesus didn't pull up the spiritual sea cap to make sure you were worthy of a relationship. He just loved. In other words, when every Christian looks back at their past, uh, they can say this, our first fill in the blank, that grace is your past. It, it appeared. It saved you. And if someone's ever given you a gift that you didn't deserve, I can tell you this, it messes with your heart. When someone loves you and they shouldn't, it, it gets down deep. And God knows that if he can give you undeserved love, that that can mess with you in a way that simple logic can't. He says to the church, listen, grace is your past. In the next verse, Paul says it's not just your past. He says in verse 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said every Christian is waiting for the blessed hope. Um, blessed means happy in the Bible, and hope means something for sure in the future. So if you're a Christian, you have this happy hope, this for sure, guaranteed, fantastic future. And what's your future? The appearing of the glory of God. Uh, glory is a common Bible word that simply means, wow. That one day, you're going to look up and you're going to see Jesus. And everything you said no to, every little bit of pleasure that sin would have given you, I guarantee you, you will not regret it. When Jesus appears in all of his glory and you say, wow, when he looks at you in the eye and says, well done. I saw that. You could have taken the smooth, easy road, you didn't. Well done. And he'll marvel at your good works, and you'll marvel at, at his grace. That, that's what you're waiting for. And that moment, his well done will echo throughout your eternity. Which means it makes zero sense to say yes to sin in the moment. You know, when you're seven years old and you're sitting in the back of the Chrysler Town and Country on the drive to Florida, it feels like forever. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? Do you know what happens, though, when you get older? Time Time flies. Pastor Michael told me an older member of our church at a Thursday night service said, Pastor Michael, when you get old, you learn that life is like a roll of toilet paper. It just goes faster at the end. <laughs> and I think about that. The wait seems like forever, like, oh, say no to this sin. But you're, you're going to find out soon that life goes fast. You, you're 
in high school, and then you blink, and you're 40, and then you blink, and you're 60, and you blink, and you're, you're 80. It goes so fast, which means we are so close to seeing the glory of God, which will make every temptation look so small, and every act of obedience seem so good. So when sin is tempting you this week, I want you to be like someone who knows that the best meal is coming. The devil's picking up a taco he dropped on the ground, and he's trying to offer it to you. But if you know a feast is on the way, steak cooked just the way you like it, it wouldn't make any sense to eat that. Because God will satisfy that hunger. So Paul says grace is not just your past, it's also your future. And, there's one more thing Paul has to say. Here's our last verse for today. Speaking of Jesus, Paul said, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. Why would you be eager to do what's good? Paul says, because in this very moment, you are God's people. Redeemed people, purified people, you are the very people of God. Did you ever stop and think about that? You're a child of, of God. You know, I'm not into, like, gossip tabloids, but I've heard rumors that when, like, Kanye and Kim's little kid shows up in public, people flip. And when the royal family has a baby and, and William and Kate's kid smiles and waves at the camera, they pay like six figures for the picture. But think about who you are. <laughs> no disrespect to Kanye, but this is Christ. And you're not some little son of the prince. You are a child of the king. You are God's people. Which means that sin doesn't fit you. It's just not who you are. The Apostle Paul would say it this way, I, I know there's something inside me, but that's not me, that's, that's sin. Because I'm a child of God. And so when temptation comes at you this week, you can say, no, that's not me. That's, that's not what people like me do. I'm a child of God. I'm purified, redeemed, holy, and good. You've you got to pick on someone else. Not today, Satan. Because I'm living for my father. And so Paul would say, grace is your past, and we're waiting for grace in the future, but grace is also your present. It's who you are right now. And you put that big timeline together, and you get today's big idea. So if you have a pen in your hand, here's what the Bible has to say, that grace teaches us to change. God's number one way of changing your heart is grace. The Apostle John said it this way, we love because he first loved us. He, he started it, and so we continue it. So let me leave you today with one application and one last story. Here's the application. Now you know why we play the video. I was kind of watching uh, some of you when we played that Roots video at the, the start of church. And some of you look like you weren't watching it. <laughs> well, I'm taking names. So if I, <laughs> no, no I, I get that, right? We play you know, this Roots thing. It's like every, every single Sunday. But do you know wh why we do that? Why we just pound this drum week after week and year after year? Is because Roots put you in the soil of grace. Because as, as pastors and as a church, we know that life out there is so uncertain and your jobs and your families and your doctors don't always give you good news. And people out there, their love is so often conditional. They love you if you're good and they don't if you're not. Which is why we want you to gather. Every Sunday to hear that Jesus redeems you from all wickedness, that you can confess anything and there's grace in response. It's why I want you to have a group of Christian people who love Jesus and they love to tell you about Jesus. You can confess to them and be real and they say, you know that God loves you, right? 
That's why we want you to grow, to have a Bible app, a plan, so that day after day after day, even if everything else falls apart, you have this rock of grace. Because we know that if you plant roots, the Holy Spirit will produce fruit. Oh, by the way, do you know what the last fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So if you want to control yourself, if you want to say no to that old sin that knows your name, get roots. Because roots give you grace. And if you think your problem is too big to fix, that it's been too many years for you to change, let me tell you one last story. Uh, it's a story about this guy. <laughs> the little man in the red robe up in the tree. You know who that is? Yeah, that's Zacchaeus. So back in Jesus' day, there was this ultra-corrupt, greedy, money-hungry tax collector named Zacchaeus. The, the Bible says he didn't just hustle people. He was the hustler of hustlers, the chief tax collector who lived at the intersection of a major road in the ancient world. He loved money. He robbed as many people as he could. He lived for it. Until one day, he changed. One day, Zacchaeus stood up in front of a crowd of people and he said, half, everything I got, I want to give half of it right now to the poor. And if I took something from any of you, I want to give it back. No, no, I don't want to give it back. I want to give you four times back what I took. And I imagine the jaws all dropped. What, what changed that guy? Now, you people who are new to church should know something. The hardest thing in the world to change is what you do with money. So much easier to show up on a Sunday than to give 10% or 20% or, or 50%. And, and do you know who the hardest person is to give money? A rich person. You got a dollar, 10%'s a dime. You got a million, 10%'s a lot. So what in the world changed this guy? 50% wealthiest guy in the block. Well, it's the other guy in the red robe. That's Jesus. And one day when he was walking by, he didn't turn his back on this dirty sinner. He stopped. And Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. And the crowd murmured and whispered, wait, 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 does, does Jesus know who this guy is? And Jesus knew exactly who he was. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save people who were lost. And when he did, when he saved them by grace, it changed this man's heart. So I'm not sure what kind of self-control you need in your life, I don't know what you really, really are praying would change in the year to come. But I do know this. If you want to change, the best place on planet Earth to begin is with grace. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father, you know how much this matters. Um, you know that if some of the people in this room push it with, with drinking there's going to be an accident and we can't take it back. And you know that if the relationship doesn't turn around, the kids are going to see their dad half the time. And you know, Heavenly Father, how damaging it is when that search history is revealed. You know the damage of sin. And Father, you know the blessing of love. You know what a great thing it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity when we let go of bitterness and forgive people who've sinned against us in the past, you know how blessed it is to give instead of just trying to get. And so we need your help, Father. We can come to church and we can open our Bibles, but only you can change us from the inside out and produce the fruit of self-control. So I thank you today, Jesus, for what you did. We didn't deserve it, but you still gave it. And I ask you right now, Holy Spirit, because you know what everyone needs Give us self-control. In the moment this week of temptation, help us to remember this message. 
even more importantly, help us to remember the message of the gospel, that we are loved free of charge because of your grace. We pray this all knowing that you hear us because we are your very own, and we ask you today in Jesus' name, amen.